Hey there, welcome back to another Eye Care for Your Brain with board certified neuropsychologist, Dr. Karen Sullivan. Tonight is another bite size edition. Watch me do science-based brain health in 10 minutes or less. Tonight's topic is treatable causes for dementia. Now dementia requires three criteria be met. The first one is a new onset decline in memory or one other cognitive domain. So that can be language, either receptive language, understanding what's being said, that can be expressive speech, so that might be word finding difficulties, difficulty coming up with exactly what we wanna say. It can be executive function issues, difficulty with multitasking, difficulty with organization, or it can be visuospatial, learning, memory, all of those different cognitive domains. The second thing is that the issues, the cognitive symptoms have to be significant enough to the point we're interfering with instrumental activities of daily living. So this would be financial matters, remembering medications and appointments, and driving. The third thing is that all treatable or reversible causes have to have been considered and ruled out. And the reason I wanted to do this brief lecture is not enough people know exactly what should be advocated for in order to feel like everything that is treatable or reversible has been ruled out. We have more than 50 conditions that mimic all three of those criteria of dementia. And a very important first step, the most necessary first step in any gold standard evaluation of brain function is ruling out all of these potential causes. So I wanna go through the eight most common with you today and you can remember them with the mnemonic dementia. So we're gonna go through one for each letter, D-E-M-E-N-T-I-A. So let's start with the first one, that is D. The first one is drugs. We always wanna think about what medications people are taking. Most specifically, new ones that are started or ones that have been abruptly stopped. So very often we see brain changes, neurochemical changes that happen as a result of polypharmacy. So sometimes it's not even the sole responsibility of the new chemical, the new drug, the new prescription, the new over-the-counter supplement. Sometimes it's interaction effects with something you're already taking. So we really wanna be sensitive about looking at benzodiazepines, opioid medications, and a class of medications we call anticholinergics. These are across every different type of medication class, but we typically see them in medications that help people hold in their urine, so urinary retention medicines, and over-the-counters that have a PM at the end of the name. These medications essentially rob the brain of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which is essential for learning and memory, and results in people having a syndrome that involves dry mouth, dry eye, sometimes trouble urinating, and a mental fogginess that oftentimes has a memory component to it. So we always wanna review people's medications. The next one is E, and E stands for emotional. We have pseudo-dementia, which is when depression is so severe that it actually starts to mimic dementia. People become so withdrawn and have so much trouble engaging, there's just no mental energy to interact with the world that they really start to look like they have advanced dementia. We can also see when things like trauma and traumatic stress and anxiety get to be too much, it becomes such an internal distractor that it can really make it seem like information isn't being processed normally, or people are so preoccupied with an internal hurt or a trauma or anticipating a future trauma, waiting for the other shoe to drop, that they're not really fully there when information is given to them. So it looks like a memory problem when really it's an encoding problem. The problem is they weren't really fully present in the first place. The next one, M, stands for metabolic. And we most typically see these type of treatable symptoms that mimic dementia in thyroid disorders. So we're not doing a great job 
of closely monitoring thyroid levels over time or doing a full enough panel to appreciate the impact of more than just T4. We kind of have this generic standardized way of evaluating thyroid levels, but they don't really capture the full picture. Oftentimes you have to see an endocrinologist to really understand your full panel and get treated for all of the different types of ways thyroid hormone can be transformed in the body. Thyroid hormone is also very, very fragile and susceptible to change. Many of you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It's the number one autoimmune condition in women. And what happens to those of us who have it is our numbers creep up a little and they go down a little, depending on the antibodies and the level of autoimmunity that's happening in that given moment. And with a little bit of hyper or a little bit of hypothyroid, we have subtle cognition changes and some people are very sensitive to those. So we always Always want to make sure we're advocating at the very front end of any cognitive workup that thyroid has been totally ruled out. The next one, E, is for eyes and ears. So often I'll see an older adult who is struggling with memory, and it turns out they're actually not hearing what's being said. Or an older adult might come to me with uh, complaints that they're having a visual illusion. So they see things kind of okay, but they're misperceiving the object, thinking maybe a tree out in the yard is a man. Um, or they're having full-blown visual hallucinations, and we immediately go to a psychiatrist psychiatric explanation when really it can be what we call a filling in syndrome of a sensory deficit. So when the brain is not getting very clear sensory information from the eyes, from the ears, really touch even, or smell or, or taste, the brain tends to fill in with kind of imaginary stimuli to give brain cells the input that they desperately need to live. So very often, the first thing we have to do in a dementia workup is make sure sensory function is assessed and then optimize to the degree that's realistic. The N is normal pressure hydrocephalus. We sometimes call this water on the brain. This is when cerebrospinal fluid is not able to drain out of the ventricles in the brain at a normal rate. This can either be after an accident, like a fall, or sometimes we actually get stenosis in the aqueducts that fluctuate and expand and contract and allow the water flow to be as it should. So very often these folks have a set of three different symptoms. Uh, the first one is urinary incontinence. The second one is mental status that waxes and wanes. And the next one is trouble with balance. We sometimes call this the three W's of wet wacky, wet, and wobbly, which is not the nicest term I've ever used, but it is a training tool. And it is a way to communicate with people about what is a very easy way to another mnemonic to be able to remember what are the symptoms of NPH or normal pressure hydrocephalus. This can definitely be ruled out with even a basic CT scan so we can look at the amount of fluid that's being held in the skull. The next one, the T is for tumor or any space occupying lesion. The space, the real estate that is available within and the skull is very finite. It is not a place where it is hospitable to have uh, visitors. So when the brain has something else that's taking up space, it can do for a short amount of time a pretty impressive job of folding up, moving over. I've seen brains on neuroimaging that are all bunched up in the right frontal lobe because blood is taking up the entire back part of the brain but there's a huge price to pay for this. And this is one of the reasons we say that time is brain because the brain cannot survive doing that for, for more than a very finite amount of time. So anything that is taking up space in the brain that shouldn't be there is very often a cause for cognitive change. The next one, the I is for infection. This is a huge problem in older adults. We have really an epidemic of chronically un or undertreated urinary tract infections, which people 
either don't recognize the symptoms because maybe a little cognitive impairment. Sometimes there's no symptoms actually as we get older. There's no burning. There's no um, running to the bathroom every five seconds. There's no pain. So anytime there is a sudden mental status change in someone over the age of 60, the, the most straightforward thing to do would be to make sure they have a urine screen to see if there's any UTI. If they've had a UTI anytime in the last year, you want to still retest because very often people don't take all of the antibiotics. They maybe start to feel better if they did have symptoms or they just forget, right? Or they don't want to take antibiotics. They're worried about the impact. And so the, the most uh, benign of the bacteria may be killed, but the strongest bacteria come back in full force. So very often people don't ever really get rid of a UTI and it just kind of rages silently. And the last one, the letter A in dementia is for anemia. There are multiple vitamin deficiencies, specifically iron deficiency, vitamin B12, and even vitamin D, low levels of vitamin D can cause a mental fogginess, a dullness, aches and pains, bone pain, that very often can mimic some of the things that we see in dementia. Once these conditions are ruled out, then you get to move on to the comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation. And that is where we do a detailed review of medical records, comprehensive cognitive testing, oftentimes paper and pencil testing, mood assessment. Sometimes we request neuroimaging or maybe if it's been done. And our job is to integrate all of these findings. And sometimes we do wind up suggesting back to primary care or back to neurology that, hey, we haven't really done the front end of ruling out the treatable or the reversible causes. So let's make sure we go back and let's look at vitamin B12 or let's look at thyroid. Most primary care docs and certainly most neurologists understand what panel should happen at the very front end because even though we don't tend to find a lot in these initial screens, there are certainly exceptions and many times where the cognitive symptoms are treated in a matter of a day, two days, just by changing medications, getting antibiotics into someone. Um, sometimes we need to do more invasive procedures like a shunt procedure for a normal pressure hydrocephalus, but there are so many people who have been labeled as having cognitive impairment, including dementia, that really have a treatable condition that I felt compelled to make this one of our bite sizes today. Now remember, once someone has dementia, that label is just the beginning of a much more detailed assessment because we have over a hundred diseases in the brain that cause the syndrome of dementia. So you really have to advocate for what is causing the dementia because that's how we're gonna get to personal brain health care. Please share your experiences with having any treatable issues of cognitive impairment. How did your own primary care doc react when you brought up concerns about cognitive change I would love to hear your real world experience. Thank you guys so much. Please like and share and continue to subscribe for more science-based brain health. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.